Good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. I know a lot of people joining from different parts of the world. Um, I hope you enjoyed the two-day conference, and we are nearly to end of the, the conference. We just have one more with this Q&A panel. Um, so good to be here, uh, hosting Jim Evans here. Jim, uh, we are so glad to have you. Hello, hello. It's good to be here. Really good to be here. Yeah, a slight introduction about Jim Evans. Uh, I've been knowing him for past 10 years now. And uh, he's one of the uh, source of inspiration for me to get contributed into Selenium project. And Selenium project has seen many people as a committer, but Jim is one of the people who's been very consistent, uh, who's been sticking around for a lost, you know, long time. And we were just chatting in the backstage, and he just mentioned uh, 2019 December he was actually turning 10 year anniversary in Selenium project. So how cool is that? Uh, you know, it's 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 not easy to have that sort of commitment. And, and, and Jim, we're, we're so glad and happy to have, uh, have such a committed person as part of the project. And, and not just that, Jim Evans is, you know, he's, he's very committed to the Selenium project and, and he's one of the main persons behind driving the .NET client bindings. And not just, not just that, he's also a project leadership committee member, uh, along with me, Marcus and Simon uh, and Alexi. And even more interesting, he also extends his time and helps us, you know, scouting uh, new places for conference. I could easily remember the time that we spent in Japan, Jim, uh, which is wonderful and, and, and it's very relaxing if we think back about it. Uh, with no further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, take up the full stage and, and here we are, Jim Evans on I'm Not Special. <laughs> Thanks very much, Manoj. Thanks very much for those kind words and that kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here um, uh, virtually, if, if not in person. Uh, let me uh, let me go ahead and do uh, my. Uh, I do have a slide deck, so let me go ahead and get that started. Right. So, I hope everyone has enjoyed the conference. Um, you know, it's a bit of a new world for us doing this uh, virtually instead of all being gathered together in person. But uh, uh, it, it's, yeah, it seems like it's been a pretty good experience for most everybody. Uh, and, but let me go ahead and start right up front and say, you know something, I'm, I'm not special. There's nothing really special about me. Uh, to paraphrase one of my favorite novels, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if you've ever read that, um, the description of one of the main characters, Zaffa Beeblebrox's, I'm just this guy, you know? But uh, here I am on a virtual stage talking to all of you about a product, a project that I care pretty deeply about. And so you may need some convincing that I'm not that special. So let me take a little time to share with you and tell a few stories along the way, maybe help you convince you of that. Maybe hopefully you can see that you can have just as much of an impact on communities and projects that, that, that I've had over the years. Now, first of all, let me introduce you to someone who is special. Because as is tradition, whenever I give a talk, there must be a cute cat picture. And this is our new addition to our family here at home. Um, this is Matcha. She's the new kitten in the house. This is the little one. She's been our uh, pandemic addition to the family. She came to us during, during this whole uh, pandemic just a, a few months ago. And I bring up the picture because she's little and curious, and there's about a 50-50 shot that she will make an appearance at some point, jumping up on the chair or something so that so that we can see the 50-50 chance. We'll see what happens. And now that I have your sympathy, and now that I have wowed you with an overload of cuteness, uh, let's start with a little background about me and um, how I'm not special. I mean, just like everybody, I had a childhood and I had an adolescence, and yeah, that's a photo of a very young Jim. Uh, but before I go too far into the introduction, let me also mention and recognize that while I don't really see myself as exceptional, I do have to recognize that I have a great deal of privilege that I've been afforded in my life just by the luck of having been born where I was and when I was and to the family I was born in. Uh, being a white middle-class American male has certainly made my path easier than it would be for others. But that doesn't really make me extraordinary or special, I don't think. I also have stable and well-compensated employment, which also gives me the time uh, and, and ability to contribute 
to external projects uh, like Selenium. That doesn't really make me personally any more special than anyone else, but it is it does bear repeating as we're talking about these matters that uh, what applies to me may not necessarily uh, apply to everyone and that everyone may have slightly different uh, roads that may encounter some other uh, roadblocks that I haven't had to do this. Having said all that, I have been at this computer programming thing for a while. Uh, You see, now, my father was a transportation planner, and he's mostly retired now. He's still with us, but he's mostly retired now. Uh, And as a quick aside, his undergraduate degree, if you don't know what transportation planning is, it's a discipline of civil engineering. But he would never let himself be called an engineer. Anytime somebody would try to call him an engineer, he would say, no, I'm a planner, because he's a stickler for accuracy when, when it comes to the terms one uses. But in his line of work, he relied very heavily on computers to model traffic flows, vehicular flows, pedestrian traffic flows, uh, and so on. So I've always been exposed to computers as a concept in one form or another, even from a very, very early age. And he would even occasionally bring me along with him to the data processing center Uh, to run his models, uh, because, of course, at the time, back in those days, we didn't have personal computers. All we had was mainframe computers, and you had to go and rent time on the mainframe. And so he would go down to a data processing center with his and and run his his models on the computers there that he rented time on. Uh, During that time, I, I wrote my very first program in Fortran, no less. Uh, on punch cards uh, when I wasn't too much older than when that photo was taken, actually. And that photo was taken over 40 years ago. So, um, but the, the, you know, it was a very rudimentary program. All it did was average a set of numbers. But the important thing was I could do the calculation manually myself and see that the output from the program was the same as I'd calculated it for uh, myself manually, and uh, and wow, it was it was it was amazing. And I can't tell you how many years I held on to that deck of punch cards that had the 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 program on it, and that little green bar printout from the first time that it ran uh, the the eleven by seventeen sheets of green bar uh, paper as a memento. I held on to those for years just because it was it seemed to me like pretty cool. But again, as a result, because of my father's work, uh, we were pretty early adopters of PCs in our home. And um, he managed to get his hands on a Radio Shack TRS-80. Uh, he borrowed it from a colleague, I think, and we had it for a few months in our house. And then later on, that inspired us to buy our first home PC, which was an Apple II. Uh, and uh, so I've been involved with the PC industry as both a user and an enthusiast, almost since its very beginning. If you've never seen the the, uh, 1996 documentary series, Triumph of the Nerds, which ran on the U.S. Public Broadcasting Service in 96, uh, I would seek it out. It's it's, it's a pretty good, it's a little cutesy, but it's a pretty good uh, documentary series about the early days of the computer industry, uh, the PC industry and uh, chronicling its rise to to greatness. Um, and the very first code I got paid to, to work on was something I did for my dad uh, in about 81, 1981 or 82. Uh, he wanted me, he wanted a particular report formatted a specific way. And so I had to take the data from the, his, the output of his models and get it formatted a certain way for printing. And so that, and he paid me to do that. And it was the first code I got paid to write. So, but outside of that, my childhood, my adolescence, all that was entirely unremarkable. Just a typical 1970s and 80s American suburban life with my parents and my family and my parents and my sister um, and our dog. Uh, You know, I went to primary school, I went to high school, and then I went to university. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I did drop out of high school, 
And I wasn't that great a student at university, but I did get my degree, barely, in industrial and systems engineering. I don't have a computer science degree. It's in industrial and systems engineering. And a fun fact, my grade point average at university, most people don't know this, was a 2.3 on a 4.0 scale. So for those of you keeping score at home, that means I had about a C average at university. So you know how some folks graduate from university, they graduate uh, cum laude? Well, as my uh, Mr. Acree, my high school physics teacher used to say, I graduated, oh lordy, how come? <clears throat> but I did graduate from, uh, from Georgia Tech, Go Jackets, in 1991. And I've been in the software industry ever since. Uh, personally, my, my personal life has likewise mostly been fairly unremarkable. I got married once and then I got divorced and then I got remarried, uh, this time with kids. Uh, I suppose that's one special thing about me that over the last 15 years, I've studied under an expert in interpersonal relationships and communication. And by studied under, I mean, having been married to, uh, Dr. Patty Evans is my wife and she's both an inspiration to me, and she's helped me learn an awful lot about what makes people tick, uh, even those of us here in the software industry. But talking about that interpersonal relationship and the interpersonal the way we interact with one another, that leads me to kind of one of the challenges and problems that we have as I see it in our industry. See, in our industry, we tend to revere the inventor, the visionary, the singular mind that comes up with the big idea. And this is true even for open source projects. And we put those people up on pedestals. Um, we worship them as heroes. We say, oh, I really want to be like them. And uh, Everybody who is involved with, in software, they, 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 they want to be the person that invented the thing. They, you know, very few people want, you know, strive off to be the person who contributed to the thing and made it somewhat better. They always want to be the person who invented the thing. And we do this in general, and of course there are exceptions, but we do this in general <clears throat> regardless of whether the inventor in question is skilled at personal interaction, like say Guido Van Rossum of Python fame, or even our very own, uh, my very good friend, Simon Stewart, who is very skilled at personal interaction and very skilled at making people feel welcome, or whether they're less so, like say Linus Torvalds, who, uh, you know, who by his own description is an unpleasant person. Um, and this problem is compounded somewhat in the open source space by the emergence of what I like to call public source projects. And these are projects that are ostensibly open source. They're hosted, the, the source code is hosted in a public repository, it's able to see it, but the actual access to the source code and, and ability to make changes is fairly limited to <clears throat> a corporate entity, usually. And that's true for a lot of the projects that we are uh, commonly used to using these days. Uh, even in our software testing space, that's true. Um, and in those cases, it can oftentimes be nearly impossible to influence or to make meaningful contributions to those projects unless you're an employee of the controlling entity. So the question then is, how is anyone supposed to make contributions to an open source project? What are the ways that you can make contributions when you're not part of the inner circle of that project? And more importantly, how do you overcome that initial barrier? Now, to this day, I don't feel like I personally am particularly talented or innovative as a, a, a software developer. But 
I've just found some ways to make those kinds of contributions. And what I'd like to do over the next few minutes during our time together is to share a few stories that kind of demonstrate uh, a few of the things that I've come to know to help make contributions. And they are not necessarily limited to you have to write a bunch of code in order to be a contributor. And you don't have to be incredibly special or super talented in order to use these techniques. So let me start. The first way to be able to contribute to any open source project is really to connect to it, get involved, show up. Decisions are made by those who show up. The exact forum that any given project uses for how to get connected to it may be different depending on that project, but there's almost always a way to connect with the project. Some really great ways to start connecting in a lot of projects are usually through a mailing list or an IRC or Slack channel. Uh, in the Selenium world, for example, uh, most of the main contributors are regularly logged into the IRC channel, either through an IRC client or through Slack, almost every day. And we try to be pretty accessible there. Uh, it's very easy to just ping one of us, e either by name or to mention something that we would want to, to, to comment on. Um, when there's not a global pandemic happening, Conferences and meetups are a really good place for face-to-face -face interaction. We'll see if that comes back to being uh, 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 to, to, to being a good way to do that in the future after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has subsided, as hopefully it will. Um, issues in bug trackers are traditionally a pretty poor place to try to build community in a project, but they can be a good place to contribute. Most projects that I've been aware of have a real challenge in managing their issues lists, the list of open issues for any given project. Like being able to triage incoming issues and being able to spend the time to reproduce reported issues is an incredibly valuable contribution. Even if you're not actually fixing the issues, just being able to set up an environment that reproduces the issue is a monumental contribution and be able to confirm that yes, the issue is reproducible and the issue can, 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 be, can, can be reproduced. And this is particularly so in a project like Selenium, which gets a fairly high volume of issue reports. If you want to help, pick a random issue in the issue tracker and try to reproduce it in your local environment and report back to the issue what your what your findings were. So just code itself is not the only place to contribute. I mentioned conferences and meetups being a good place to face for face to face interactions, but they're also uh, events that require a ton of hours by real people to organize and put on. And if you can lend a few hours to volunteer for an upcoming meetup or an upcoming conference, uh, that's a huge contribution to a project in its community. So volunteering of your time, even just for organizational purposes, is a great thing. Uh, there are lots of open source contributors that are decent coders but who are absolute rubbish at documentation. I know because I'm one of them. Uh, I, writing clear and concise documentation that's understandable by both beginners and more advanced users of a project is a really daunting task. And very few projects get it right. Documentation is a great way to contribute to a project and one that will almost always be appreciated by the maintainers of the project. So. That's another opportunity, a way to connect with the project and get involved. When you reach out and start to connect with the project, that initial attempt to connect can also give you a great deal of information about whether you even want to contribute. 
to that project or not. Let me tell you a little story about the first time I tried to get connected with an open source project. Uh, I was leading the test automation effort for a company that I worked for. And this company's product was a help desk application. So if you were in a company with a large IT department that had a dedicated team of support technicians, uh, those technicians could track their work and, and what open cases they had to work on and what they'd done to resolve those and so on. Um, now, this was the late 1990s, so the cloud as we know it today wasn't really a thing at that time. Client server architecture was still very much the state of the art, and uh, my team had successfully automated a large part of the tests for the desktop client application of the product that, that, uh, that our company put out. And since this was a .NET application, we used C Sharp for the test automation, and we we did a pretty good job with that, with our handwritten homegrown testing framework. We didn't buy any commercial tools off the shelf. Um, but the desktop app turned out wasn't the only way that users could use that product. It also had a little used web portal that was available. And when, um, when our product team decided to enhance and start emphasizing that web portal, as they started to notice that the web was going to be more, more of a thing, um, we needed, as the test team, we needed a way to create automated tests for that part of the product as well. And we started looking around for things we could use. Now, being a small company, it was a very small company, we had no budget for tools. So right then, that sort of let out commercial tools. We weren't going to be using commercial tools. We had to look for something that had no upfront license costs. So that meant open source. And we did look at Selenium at the time, but... Uh, at the time, all Selenium had was Selenium RC, and we rejected that as a solution for both technical and aesthetic reasons. Um, the technical reason was that RC was JavaScript execution in a frame set, and that architecture was not something we thought was appropriate. And the aesthetic reason was the single object with 150 methods on it as its API was really unappealing to us. But we came across this library called WATER, W-A-T-I-R, which is Web Application Testing in Ruby. And it looked like an API that we'd love to use. The problem was we were a .NET shop, so no one in the company knew anything about Ruby as a programming language. So I connected with the WATER project, or tried to, on its user mailing list to ask some basic questions about WATER. And unfortunately, to my dismay, some of those questions kind of showed my ignorance about Ruby as a language, that I wasn't really a Ruby user. But the responses from the project were essentially, well, you need to go learn Ruby and then come back once you've learned Ruby. And then you can ask questions about water. So that was distinctly unhelpful. So we kept looking. We were so happy with the API that we found a .NET Port of the Water API that we went on to use. It was called Watin, W-A-T-I-N, Web Application Testing in .NET. And we were pretty successful in using that uh, until we needed to do cross-browser testing because it supported IE very well, but did not support other browsers all that well. But by the time we got around to doing that, Yari Bakken, had done a ton of work with the water web driver module, which is the water API being driven by uh, the web driver as its backend to drive the browser, which is the current architecture of water today. Water today uses the Selenium uh, Ruby bindings to actually drive the browser. So I figured we could do the same thing with Wadin to get cross browser testing working using, a, using the .NET language binding of web driver. Problem was that the .NET bindings were very incomplete at the time. They hadn't been completed. Uh, so this time I tried to connect with a project, the, the WebDriver project at the time, uh, via IRC, to see if the .NET bindings were going to be completed or if they were going to abandon or what the, what, you know, what the deal was. And instead of being rebuffed, I was welcomed eagerly and folks were saying, hey, uh, the .NET bindings, we're looking for somebody to help complete them. Don't you want to be the one to do it, Jim? And I said, well, okay, sure. I guess I can take some time to try to do that. Uh, but it was that connection, that attempt to connect, which is which anyone can do, 
that 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 led to the development of the .NET bindings in C Sharp that you that we are still currently using today. Now that effort of developing those .NET bindings kind of required a lot of back and forth between me and other members of the project, Simon and others, which kind of leads me to my next point about ways you can help contribute to a project. The simple act of communicating with those involved with the project is, is, is a good way to contribute to the project. And let me take a moment to what I mean, to, to clarify what I mean by communicate. I don't mean using an attacking tone because that's almost always counterproductive. Uh, when you say what you're doing is horrible, that, that's, that's not a good way to do it. Um, that's counterproductive. And as a corollary to that, when you do say something like that and someone calls you out on that as, as, as being an attacking tone, and then you respond by saying, no, I'm attacking the work, not the person, so you shouldn't take it so seriously. Well, that's just as counterproductive, if not more so. But the reason the communication is so important is because at the root of every open source project, behind every line of code that you see in browsing the source code or that you use in, your, in, in, in using the product in the project, there is a person or people attached to it that wrote that code. During my time working on the Selenium project, and I've, I've, I've like, like Manoj said, I've been working on this project for 10 years, uh, more than 10 years. Uh, I've been called incompetent. I've been called stupid. Uh, I've been told my work is, and here's a direct quote, and it's, it's offensive, but I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, it's a direct quote, so I'm gonna apologize for the language, but I'm gonna tell you, they said that the work I've done on the project is shitty. Um, see, open communication requires that both parties in the communication approach in good faith. And if you don't have that, it's not a contribution. It's a one-way scolding. Let me tell you another quick story about how a successful communication led to a direct contribution to an open source project. And in this case, uh, the Selenium project. Uh, and I've told this story before, but it bears repeating because I know not everybody's heard it. Um, after I'd been working on the .NET bindings for a while, uh, you know, this was this was this would be after that. Uh, I I was working on the Selenium project, uh, and and while I did that for the first part, I was doing it mostly in isolation. I had my little C sharp part of the tree that I would work on, and I didn't really look at or touch most of the other parts of the of the source tree, uh, and it's kind of just working on my own in my own little isolated silo. Uh, occasionally, I mean, I was being social with with folks in the in the project, but but not really collaborating technically. Um, but by this time, I had the bindings working in a cross browser way. I had a test suite for working for the .NET bindings that was based off of the Java test suite. That 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 was it wasn't quite as extensive as that, but at least partly did some of that. And over time, I started running those tests against different browsers. And I noticed that when I ran them against Internet Explorer, if I ran just a few tests, everything would be fine. Uh, if I ran, you know, just a single class or a couple of classes out of the test suite, a test uh, out of the test suite, everything would be fine. But if I tried to run the whole suite, all of the tests from top to bottom, uh, it would start out okay. Everything would start running and it would go fine for a while, but over time, throughout the run, the tests would start to get slower and slower and even slower until it looked like they were hanging. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't figure out what that was. I assumed there was something I was doing incorrectly. Um, and it turns out there was something I was doing differently than the other language bindings, which is why they weren't seeing the problem, but I was. But, um, I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And, and then as now, the IE driver was written in C++. And in addition to being C++, it was Windows C++ and Windows C++ that used the component object model or COM. Um, and at that time, I hadn't really looked at C or C++ code like at all. Um, I did manage to figure out how to hook up a debugger at least to kind of step through and see what was happening in the driver. And sure enough, uh, what looked like was happening was that uh, there was a buffer that was being allocated every time through a specific method. 
there was this buffer being allocated and it was never released. Classic memory leak, or it, I can recognize it as that now. Uh, but at that time, it was only a vague suspicion that that doesn't look exactly right. Well, Simon had written that C++ code that made up the IE driver at that time. And he has his own stories to tell about how when he submitted it for a code review at Google, he was like, how does this even compile? But that's another story for another time. Um, he and I hadn't really kind of chatted all that much at the time in terms of being technical. I mean, we'd been a little social, but but he was still, to me, the web driver guy. You remember that whole thing? He admi- He's the guy that invented it. And so I was a little bit hesitant to bring up like technical things because, you know, Simon's brilliant, right? He's a brilliant guy. And I'm thinking, clearly, he's a very talented developer. He's he's come up with this whole framework. He's, 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 he's a very good guy. He's very smart. He's incredibly smart. There's no way he overlooks something like this, right? It's got to be something I'm doing. Uh, but I still couldn't figure out any other way. So I thought I'd better ask. I thought, well, I better ask. So I, I, I screwed up my courage one day and I engaged with him in IRC and I said, so Simon, I says, I'm looking at this file in the IE driver source tree. I'm looking at this file and right about here on this line here, it looks like you're allocating a memory buffer, but it doesn't look like you're freeing it up anywhere. And I'm seeing this performance issue when I run my tests. So I'm sure you already thought of this. And I know I'm overlooking something, but but it's probably something I'm doing wrong. But 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 what do you think? And thankfully, Simon being the approachable guy that he is, he took a look. He said, you know what? Sure enough. That looks like a that looks like a I'm not freeing that up. Let's let's see if I can fix that. And that was great. I was grateful to hear that because I really didn't know what the hell I was doing when it came to trying to build C code at that time. And lo and behold, we got a bug fixed. He checked it in built the pre-built binary. I put it into my .NET code and, and, and things were working great. And I made a contribution to the part of the project I never thought to look at before, simply because I was willing to communicate with somebody who knew something a little bit more about that part of the project than I did. So just simply talking with people and communicating with people, whether that's via email or IRC or in person, uh, is, is a great way to get contributions into a project, even if you're not, uh, you know, a super technical person or, um, and and it doesn't require any special skills. All it requires is just to be able to, to, to talk with someone, what we're doing right now. So once you've made contact and once you've, you know, begun to truly communicate with those who are contributing to it as well as yourself, uh, there is one more way that you can make contributions that doesn't require anything special. And before I talk about it, I'm going to pause. I'm going to put up a portrait of a famous person. So here we go. One second. This woman is an actress. Her name is Emily Proctor, and this is one of her publicity shots. And yes, I did get permission from both her and her management team to use it here. Uh, She, if you've ever watched the TV show, there's a TV show called CSI Miami. Uh, which is a spinoff of the CSI franchise that ran from about 2002 to 2012. She played a, a, a character called Callie Duquesne on that show. And Emily is my absolute favorite person in Hollywood. Hands down, no two ways about it. She's my favorite person in Hollywood. I'll tell you why she's my favorite person in Hollywood in just a minute. Because it, it ties into my third point of how to contribute to an open source project. And that's by being a good collaborator. So just like a successful open source project, if you've ever been on a movie set or a TV show set, um, it's an incredibly collaborative place. Personally, I've always been fascinated by film production. It's, 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 uh, you know, seeing how things are, are, are put together is just a fascinating process for me. And there was another TV show on the U.S. that ran from 96 to 2006, 99 to 2006, sorry, 99 to 2006. It was called The West Wing. And if you've never seen it, uh, I would seek it out. It's it's really amazing. Uh, I'm a fan of the show for life. It was set in a fictional U.S. presidential administration, and the president and his staff were the main characters. I was a huge fan of the show then, and I'm a huge fan of the show now. 
I was incredibly lucky enough to have won a charity auction. You know, I, I donated some money in a charity auction and the prize that I won was a visit to the set of the West Wing. And I got to go on the set. I got to spend the day during the production of its second season. I got to meet the crew. I got to meet the cast. I got to meet some of the writers. Uh, and I got to watch them do some filming, which was really cool. And that was really where I learned a lot about film and TV production. Like, a simple scene of two people talking requires a simultaneous coordination of dozens, if not hundreds of people. You've got hair and makeup, you've got camera operators, you've got the director and multiple assistant directors and uh, sound people and uh, lighting people and set and prop construction people all working together at the same time to try to pull this whole thing off. And I got to spend some time with some of the cast members, meeting them, chatting with them. And there's a lot of downtime for the main actors when, uh, when, uh, when you're filming any sort of scene because you have to do different camera setups for different, uh, a, a simple scene of two people talking may start with say the establishing shot of two people facing each other talking. And then you'll cut to a close up of one of them saying something. And then you maybe you'll talk, you'll do you see an over the shoulder shot of the reaction to what they're saying and so on. And those involve multiple camera setups. And you have, every time you have to cut, have to relight the whole thing, redo everything, and while they're doing all of that setup, the actors don't have anything to do. They just have to sit around and wait. So I had a fair amount of time to chat with some of the crew, with some of the uh, the, the 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 cast that, that I met there, uh, Martin Sheen. But Emily was on the set one day. She was one of the people who who was who, she was one of the actors working, and she was kind enough during her off times when she wasn't when she wasn't in the middle of, of, of filming. Uh, she between takes she she was. Um, she spent a fair amount of time chatting with me, just saying, hey, who are you? How, how are you enjoying things? Are, are you liking what you're seeing? Thanks for being a fan of the show. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you, you coming down. What do you do for a living? You know, we really just kind of vibed and, and chatted. And after she was done shooting for the day, I mean, she even insisted on posing with me for some photos on the set. Like there's a, I've got a couple of pictures of me behind the resolute desk, the, the prop resolute desk with her handing me some pictures or some photos or some uh, papers and stuff. It was really, she was really lovely. And she's one of my favorite people. So we're saying our goodbyes. And I had said something like, you know, it was really great to have met you. I'm really glad to have gotten the chance to come and see everything. And, and you know, thanks for taking the time to be so generous with it for me today. And she says, hey, so did did I get the chance? To, she asked me, did I get the chance to see everything I wanted to? Did I get the chance to meet everybody and everything? I said, well, I didn't get the chance to meet. You know, I did get the chance to talk to Martin for a little while, but I didn't get the chance to to to, to meet Rob Lowe at all. That's OK. He was really busy. He's, you know, I did get to see him work. I got to see him act and perform, and that was fantastic. I didn't get a chance to actually speak with him, but that's okay. No worries. I'm, I'm totally satisfied with what I got. Um, and there was one more scene to be shot for the evening. She was done for the day. She wasn't in that in that scene, so she was going to go home. Um, but they weren't going to shoot it on the soundstage. They were shooting it. Uh, it, it was it was set in uh, the White House kitchen, so they were going to actually film it at the Warner Brothers commissary. This was a Warner Brothers show. And they were, they, so on the Warner Brothers studio lot is, is a huge place and lots of distance between places. So they have golf carts and shuttles and things that they, that they use to get around between, between buildings and things. So they were going to get one for us, for, for, for me to take me over there so I could watch them do this last scene at the, in the evening. Um, and I was standing outside the soundstage waiting for them. And uh, uh, waiting for a shuttle, and I hear my name being out, Jam, Jam. I hear that. I'm like, so I so I turn around and I look, and I look around. And I see, I see Emily. She's still in her hair and makeup. You know, her her character was wearing her hair up. She had her tweed suit on, the whole thing, and she's still in hair and makeup and wardrobe from what she was shooting. And she's running around the side of the building. I mean, she's booking it right now. You have to understand. Where these scenes were filmed was in was it stage 29 on the Warner Brothers lot, which is uh, a little over 17,000 square feet in area, which is about 30 meters wide by 50 meters long, the building. It's a huge building, right? Turns out she had run around the entire outside of the building looking for me um, because she wanted to catch up to me. She just to find me. She catches up to me. She says, she catches up to me. She says, I'm so glad I found you. You said you didn't get a chance to meet Rob. Come on with me. So she takes me around the building to the side where the cast trailers are. The, the, the main cast has trailers, like 
glorified RVs that they use for dressing rooms um, to get away so they have a place to go and rest while they're waiting between takes and such. And uh, she proceeds to knock on the door of one of them. And, and she gets, she, she's, you know, who is it? And she says, hey, it's Emily. Can you come out here for a second? She gets Rob Lowe to come out and just, and just for a few minutes, just to say hi and meet me. And, and she was kind enough to take a photo of Rob and me together. And, and, you know, he was very gracious with his time. Thanks for being a fan of the show, blah, blah, blah. You know, but, you know, what really struck me and it stayed with me to this day, and this is why Emily is my favorite person in Hollywood. This woman, she didn't know me from anybody, right? I was just a random guy that happened to show up at her place of work one day. Uh, no other reason than just to hang out. She's never going to see me again, probably never going to hear from me again after that day. But she went out of her way to make me feel included and wanted and special. And that is why she is my favorite person in Hollywood. Now, I tell you that story because that's another great way that you can help contribute to open source projects. Every project that's out there has a community. And you can be that person in the community that can be the welcoming voice to the new person that shows up in the chat room and says, hey, I'm new to the project. I don't know how to do X. Help me with that. Or on the or on the user facing mailing list that says, "Hey, I have a question about why. How how do I do why with Selenium? You can be that special person that collaborates on a pull request by reviewing their code, even if you're not going to be the one to merge it. You can say, "Hey, I'm not sure this does what you think it does," um, or testing it out. Uh, even if you're not the owner of the project, you can do these things and make people feeling welcome and wanted and part of the project. It seems like a small thing. It really does seem like a small thing. But as my wife, Patty, always says, people may forget what you say, but they will never, ever, ever forget how you make them feel. So if you connect and communicate and collaborate, those are some great ways. And, and those are the ways that I've tried to help make my way in the open source world and make contributions and ways that you can, too without being, it doesn't require any special skills to do it, just being a, 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 a great person. Um, I have had a trying time the last couple of years as part of the Selenium community for various reasons. Um, and it's been a bit of a, 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 a long road for me personally. I've struggled with, am I really making a difference? Is, is, is the project, has the project outlived its usefulness with, respect to some of the competing projects that have come up over the last few years and some of the nastiness with which they have attacked the Selenium community. Um, and I was reminded just the other day that uh, without my parts of the Selenium community, uh, that a, a couple of people independently told me that without your work on Selenium, I, I wouldn't have had a career. So, um, you know, that made me feel really great because again, I don't think I'm anybody special. I'm just this guy, you know, I just do the thing. And I would encourage you to just do the thing too. Thanks for listening, everybody. I, I, I'm about out of time. You've been an amazing, amazing audience and you've been very generous with your time and attention. And for that, I thank you very much. Hey, hey, Jim, thank you very much for such a wonderful and such an inspiring story, I would say. I was just looking at the Discus tab. I, I'm, I'm sure you would have some time to look at that as well. Uh, it's very relatable and practical for each and every one of us, and, and you made us very special. And thanks a lot, Jim, for sharing that. We are so glad to have you here. All right. Well, it's been my pleasure, everybody. Uh, hey, stick around. We're going to do a Q&A with the uh, Selenium conference or the Selenium uh, uh, committers. So that'll be fun. Absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Thanks again. And uh, taking this opportunity to thank all the sponsors of Selenium conference. So Slabs, Frozen Stack, Best Project, Get Gauge, Rockworks, Happy Tools, TU, and DQ. Thank you. Thanks very much.